There are no further introductions, therefore it's time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I hope everyone has had a chance to see the Ontario Chamber of Commerce letter today. They had a lot to say about cap and trade. In fact, they had many of the same concerns that the Ontario PC caucus from Glengarry had been Russell. They noted that cost could lead to Ontario losing out on jobs and investment. That's from the Chamber of Commerce, losing out on jobs and investment. The Chamber noted the Liberals must consider how we can prevent <laughs> exporting jobs and investment and it, while importing pollution. But that's just what their scheme does. Mr. Chief Speaker, government whip. will this government stop exporting jobs and importing pollution under their dangerous cap and trade scheme? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, um, I'm sure that the Leader of the Opposition knows that the federal government has mandated that every province and territory have some form of carbon pricing in place by 2018, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure he's aware of that, and I'm sure, if he, I'm sure he's aware that the reason for that, Mr. Speaker, is that as humanity, we are facing the greatest challenge in our, uh, in our history, Mr. Speaker, understanding that climate change is real. So we're taking the lead in Ontario uh, to move forward with the plan to uh, cap the pollution that businesses can release in order to reduce that pollution, Mr. Speaker, in order to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. And we've chosen this, Mr. Speaker, because it best balances affordability with emission reduction. That's why we've chosen it. In fact, Mr. Speaker, yes, the plan, the, the proposal that the Leader of the Opposition has talked about would cost four times as much Member as what we are going to order. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. In case you didn't hear it, the member from Renfrew come to order. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier said this is mandated by the federal government. Well, let me say the federal government did not mandate Ontario to be sending $200 million to California by 2020. It did not mandate Ontario to be sending almost $2 billion by 2030 to subsidize businesses in California and Quebec. This makes us less competitive. The Auditor General has said this does not even help with reducing emissions in Ontario. And as the Chamber says, this is about importing pollution to Ontario. So now we have the Auditor General saying you're not going to reduce significantly emissions in Ontario, and you've got the Chamber saying you're going to import pollution. Can you not take a pause and look at this? Why are you going to continue to help businesses in California? Mr. Speaker, so let's just look at what the Conservatives want us to do. They want us to go down a road that would be more expensive, Mr. Speaker, but even more worrisome, Mr. Speaker, it would be less effective. Yep. There are young people sitting in the gallery today, Mr. Speaker. There are young people who are interested in a sustainable future for the planet, Mr. Speaker. So it is critical. It is critical that every jurisdiction do its part, Mr. Speaker. We've chosen the most effective, the most cost-effective, the most affordable process, Mr. Speaker. What the Conservatives are suggesting would cost businesses and individuals, families, four times what the plan we are in, we are putting in place would cost, Mr. Speaker. So it makes no sense. Answer. It would not be as effective, and it certainly would not be as affordable, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Uh, Speaker, the Premier makes assertions that are not based on reality. The reality is the Chamber is not concerned about any other plans. The, the Chamber is concerned about the, this Premier's cap and trade. My hope was that as soon as I started hearing some of the heckling, I asked people to stop. It has not happened, so I am dangerously close to going to warnings quickly. If that's the case, so be it. Mr. Speaker, the Premier says this is about protecting the planet for, for children watching here today. The reality is her plan does not do that. This government, according to the Auditor General, their plan will cause us to lose jobs, lose investment. The Chamber has made that clear. We're going to be importing pollution under their plan. Can you imagine that? Importing pollution? Yeah. We're not even reducing emissions here, yet we're putting a huge new cost on business? Why does this Premier want to kill jobs in Ontario and actually import pollution? It doesn't make sense. It's as bad as the Green Energy Act that hurts Ontario and makes us less competitive. Mr. Speaker. You seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you.
Premier. Minister of the Environment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Member, Leader of the Opposition is proposing to increase carbon pricing in Ontario from $18 a tonne in ours to $72 a tonne. But, you know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm just curious about something. If the Leader of the Opposition could just turn slightly to the left and talk to the member for Leeds Grenville, who's, who supports Kevin O'Leary for leadership. And Kevin O'Leary said, Patrick Brown, if he wants to bring carbon taxation to Ontario, even though he's a Conservative, I'll campaign against him. I'll work very hard to make sure he stays out of power, Mr. Speaker, so that even his deputy leader doesn't agree with him. Carbon tax makes no sense, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. <coughs> On April 29, 2015, I quote, any decision of the magnitude require a two-thirds majority of the Hydro One Board of Directors, which means having 40 percent ownerships, protects us. Who said that? The current Premier of Ontario. October 20, 2015, I quote, the Premier said, with 40 percent ownership of the board, that would require the people of Ontario always to have a say. Who said that? The Premier. October 28, 2015, and I quote, will there be the ability for the government to retain control over major decisions because of that 40 percent ownership? Yes. That's the Premier again. All these were said by the Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier, very clear. The Premier has always maintained that with this share, that the government will have control of Hydro One over big decisions. Question. These are the Premier's words. Is that still the case today? Thank you. Premier. Yes, it is, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. So the Premier is saying we have control of Hydro One. She's on the record numerous times saying that. Yet when we asked about the Hydro One executive salaries, the government's response is, we have no control, we have no say, this is a private company. You can't have it both ways. The Premier is on the record saying we're retaining control. She pitched that to Ontarians under her fire sale of Hydro One, and now we have salaries that, frankly, are offensive. We have multi-million dollar salaries, we've got a millionaire's club of senior executives at Hydro One, and the government's saying they have nothing to do with it. They're speaking out of both sides of the mouth. They can't have it both ways. So my question is, given the fact that you've said you have control, yes or no, will you rein in these offensive executive salaries? As I, as I have done in the past, I just want to tell the member that uh, an expression was used that I do not allow to have happen, but I didn't see an outrage, but I will remind him not to use that phrase again. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member opposite <clears throat> probably knows that when we put the prospectus out, it was very clear as to what those salaries would be. We were very transparent and open as to what would occur going forward. We recognized we wanted the company to be more responsive to consumers, ensuring that they relate better to the customers and the rate base, and they've been doing so, Mr. Speaker. The company has now improved dramatically since its inception. They attracted some of the brightest and the smartest out there to enable us to attract greater value for this company, which ultimately benefits all Ontarians going forward, including Mr. Speaker, our ability now to reduce rates by 25 percent. The salaries were fully disclosed last year, Mr. Speaker, before today. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I did not get an answer. The Premier is on the record, and I quote again, the people of Ontario will retain de facto control of Hydro One. 
The Premier promised Ontarians that we'd have control over Hydro One, and yet here we are seeing offensive salaries. $4.5 million as a salary is appropriate? Give me a break. It's not, Mr. Speaker. And yet this government is trying to hide from it. They promised us control. They're walking away from that. It's not too late to do the right thing. You still have the majority of the shares. You still have control if you actually meant what you said. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is this. Yes or no, will you rein in these offensive executive salaries that are completely out of context with the rest of the country, completely out of context with what people make? It's too much. It's wrong. The Premier needs question. to clean this up. Mr. Speaker, it's critical that this operation, this corporation, and do its utmost to provide greater value for the ratepayers and for the people of Ontario. And that is what is occurring, Mr. Speaker, because the net value to the ratepayers and the shareholders, which, as a member opposite has rightly noted, is the province of Ontario, will always be the majority shareholder, will always have the largest say. We do have the ability, Mr. Speaker, of gaining more value from this corporation to allow the operators to do its job effectively and in a competitive manner, Mr. Speaker. That now we have an opportunity to foster consolidations around the industry. There are 72 competitors in Ontario distributing hydro, Mr. Speaker. We need them all to do better. This corporation is doing just that. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Does the Premier believe it's fair for Hydro One to jack up delivery rates, rates by 20 per cent at the same time as hydro executives get a multi-million dollar raise? Mr. Speaker, we, we are reducing people's hydro bills around this province by 25 per cent, Mr. Speaker. There's already an 8 per cent reduction in place. On top of that, another 17 per cent, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that people across the province need help with their electricity bills. We recognize that uh, with the 8 per cent, that was not enough. There needed to be more. And, Mr. Speaker, we also recognize that people outside of uh, dense urban areas, so in more remote and rural areas, need more support, Mr. Speaker. So they will see not a 25 per cent reduction but in some instances a 40 or 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. That is going to happen this summer. Those are real impacts of the plan that we've brought forward, Mr. Speaker, that will help people in their lives to make sure they can pay their bills and look after their families. That's the step yes, that we are taking, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Yesterday, the Premier and our Minister of Energy defended Hydro One CEO's 500 percent salary increase, saying it was because they introduced e-billing. Well, I'm not sure if that was a joke or not, Speaker, because let's be honest, the biggest news coming out of Hydro One is that they want to have an increase of delivery rates by 20 per cent. That's the biggest news coming out of Hydro One. Will the Premier tell Ontario families whether she thinks Hydro One's CEO should be getting a 500 per cent raise? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I have said many times, I know that these are high salaries. I, I understand that. The, the focus of our initiative, Mr. Speaker, has been on reducing people's hydro bills, giving them a break, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize that the building that we have done, the investments that had to be made, Mr. Speaker, because the electricity system was in shambles, that there's a cost associated with those, Mr. Speaker. And so we've been removing costs from the electricity system. We recognize that wasn't enough. And so now, this summer, people will see a 25 per cent reduction on their electricity bills. And, Mr. Speaker, outside of the urban areas, in more remote and rural areas, a 40 to 50 per cent reduction, Mr. Speaker. We understand that that's what people need. That's the plan that we've brought forward, Sir? and that's what we're implementing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, Final Speaker, there is no plan, but it sounds like a bouncing ball. First it was 17, then 25. Now it's 40 or 50. I don't think a single Ontarian believes this government. to jack up delivery rates by 20 per cent at the same time that hydro executives get multi-million dollar raises. And the Premier and her Minister of Energy don't seem to have a problem with this at all. When will the Premier stop advocating for the 1 per cent and start advocating for the 99 per cent? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. 
Mr. Speaker, the 99% the is exactly who are going to see a 25% reduction. And if you add 17% and 8%, Mr. Speaker, you get 25%. If you look at distribution charges that are going to be brought down in the remote and rural areas, you get that 25% up to 40 or 50%, Mr. Speaker. That's how those numbers have been calculated because those are the reductions that people are going to see on their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we recognize that the costs of the investments that we have made in an electricity system that was in shambles, Mr. Speaker, that was not reliable Answer. and was not clean, that there was a cost associated with that. That's why people will see those reductions come summer. Thank you. Yep. Questions for the, for the uh, Premier. Uh, $1,650 is already a ridiculous amount of money to have to pay to rent a one-bedroom apartment that is less than 500 square feet and has no balcony, but that is the reality of Graham Farquhar. As if $1,650 a month wasn't high enough, Graham got a shock recently when he found out that his landlord is planning to double uh, that rent on July 1st of this year. Yesterday, the Premier said this was, and I quote, really unacceptable, but refused to say when she's actually going to do something about it. Can the Premier tell us when her expressions of sympathy will be backed up by something a little more tangible, like closing the 1991 rent control loophole, which we could actually do today? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I I'm well aware that the, uh, certainly the member for Toronto Danforth understands how important this is yes. because uh, when he raised it and our Minister of Housing was, uh, was able to respond to it, we made it clear. We get this, Mr. Speaker. Something has to be done. We're going to be bringing forward not just a plan on that particular issue, Mr. Speaker, but on housing affordability, on rental affordability, because there are a number of changes that need to be made, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to bring those we're going to bring those forward in context. So there is no argument between me and the uh, leader of the third party. Something needs to be done. We recognize that. We're going to be bringing forward proposals very soon, Mr. Thank Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Supplement. Well, Speaker, time is ticking. Landlords are licking their lips, and tenants are getting really nervous about the future. Generation Squeeze issued a report today saying that the quality of life for young people living in the GTA is slipping. Speaker, The report singles out the high cost of rental housing as one of the causes, saying that young people are working full-time but, quote, watching their money down to the penny. Is the Premier planning to tell a whole generation of young people uh, that they're going to continue to see their quality of life decline because she is afraid to take action quickly to close the 1991 loophole immediately. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said in my first answer, we actually are not having an argu argument about this. I actually agree that there are things that need to be done. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, um, this issue of uh, fairness for tenants, Mr. Speaker, in the context of fairness for landlords. But when I came into office in 2003 as a, uh, the member for Don Valley West, Mr. Speaker, I actually advocated within our caucus to change the Landlord Tenant Act, Mr. Speaker. It got changed to the Residential Tenancies Act. We made a lot of changes uh, that that would help people put in place supports for uh, for tenants, Mr. Speaker. But there's more that needs to be done. There is no argument between me and the leader of the third party. There's no argument between me and the member for Toronto Danforth. There is more that needs to be done. We are bringing Answer. forward not just one item, Mr. Speaker, but we are bringing forward a, a, a package of proposals that will you. deal with housing affordability. And Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, if I was the Premier, I'd be awfully embarrassed by admitting she's been advocating for this th since 2003, and nothing has happened on this file, and people are getting economic eviction from their places. They live. The Premier, if she wanted to help, Speaker, if she actually wanted to take some action to do something about this major issue that's facing young people and thousands of tenants, she could. She could do it right now, Speaker. Will the Premier bring in the NDP bill? Will she bring it forward for a vote today, close that 1991 loophole immediately, and protect the renters of this province? Thank you. Thank you. You Thank you, Premier.
Great minister. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to. Uh, for that question, you know, uh, Speaker, it goes without saying that uh, that it's unacceptable that so many Ontarians are faced with housing costs that are rising so dramatically. It goes without saying uh, when we talk about that. You know, and as Minister of Housing, I, I want to help Ontarians, uh, every Ontarian, reach home ownership. Um, for Ontarians, a house is more than a place to sleep; it's a source of pride. You know, let's just talk about some of the things we've done. We've already said that uh, rent control, we're open to expanding that. We've said time and again, sooner rather than later, so perhaps the third party can't take yes for an answer. <laughs> we're working with our secondary, our, our municipalities to promote secondary suites because supply yes, is sir. important, and we'll have more in a supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Nice. Thank you. No question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the President of the Treasury Board. Speaker, yesterday we learned that the President at OPG, who was the top earner on the province's payroll in 2016, actually made more than $700,000 more than the Sunshine List disclosed on Friday. The difference. The difference, Speaker, uh, was a bonus that showed up on OPG's books, but was suspiciously what? left off the government's books. So, Speaker, how many more six-figure bonuses has the President of the Ontario Treasury Board hidden from the people of Ontario? Good question. Thank you. President of the Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much. And of course, what is reported on the Sunshine List, as I've said several times in here, is not the annual salary. It is the it is as your legislation requires. It is what is reported in Box 14 of the T4. It is whatever. Canada Revenue says should go in box 14 of the deep. Federal members got that it. is what is reported. Maybe now, it is also true that there are things that aren't reported. For example, not pensions. So it is not on you. Member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, come to order. So the fact that pension contributions are not reported is perfectly consistent with the law as you laid it out, because that isn't in, T in the T4 salary box. Answer. But what is also true is our new executive compensation legislation says no Thank bonuses. You. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks, Speaker. We, we've watched this government hand out six-figure performance bonuses for projects that were over budget and late or built upside down. You know, they operate like the Oprah Winfrey show over there. Look under your seat. There's probably a bonus there waiting for you. You know, here we have a project that isn't even done yet, and the government's hitting taxpayers up for hundreds of thousands of dollars again. So, Speaker, how many more big bonuses did the President of the Treasury Board hand out this year for projects that were over budget, late, or incomplete? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Speaker, when it comes to uh, OPG and the work that's happening right now with our nuclear refurbishment, Mr. Speaker, the OPG president has reported to us that they're actually under budget, Mr. Speaker, and on time, something that we expect from our executives, Mr. Speaker, and so that's great news for Ontario ratepayers. And of course, when it comes to OPG, Mr. Speaker, as the president of the Treasury Board outlined, the process is being followed by us as laid out by our framework, Mr. P Mr. Speaker, and OPG sought appropriate comparators and set compensation at a level that is restrained but if competitive for the industry, Mr. The Speaker. Let's not Carlton. forget that these are our nuclear technical experts, Mr. Speaker, and we want the operators in our plants to be the best in the world. And as the president, uh, president of the Treasury Board outlined, Mr. Speaker, Answer. Mr. Lyas' salary was reported accurately in the Sunshine List, just like every other person's salary appears on their T4, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. There you go. New question. Member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Today I read about Victoria Menini, a young woman, woman who did everything right but still can't seem to get ahead here in Toronto. Victoria works as a designer, a coveted job in her field, but she couldn't afford her rent on just that salary. So she also works as a bartender. 
Speaker. She works 60 hours a week and says she doesn't know when she's going to be able to stop living like this. The Premier could help her right now. Will she commit to supporting my bill to close the 1991 rent control loophole and help Victoria and people like her? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Once again, Mr. Speaker, and I said earlier that I know that the uh, member for Toronto Danforth understands. I, I mean, I know he listens to uh, to tenants advocacy, uh, advocacy groups. He talks to individuals, as I do in my own riding, Mr. Speaker. And I know that some of the people, like Abbas Colia, like Pat Moore, who have been working with me, Mr. Speaker, uh, that he knows those people. He knows the concerns of uh, of tenants around the province. And Chief you know, when, he brought, uh, when he brought his, uh, his bill forward, Mr. Speaker, on that very day, the Minister of Housing made it clear that this is something that we are concerned about and that, we are, uh, that we're moving forward. Mr. Speaker, we're going to be bringing forward uh, a proposal for a number of changes, Mr. Speaker, as I the said to the knows. leader of the third party. There's no argument between us on this. He knows we're this doing is something it. that needs to be done, and it's something, Mr. Speaker, that is a, ser Sir? It's a series of changes Minister on top of changes that this government that. has already made. Mr. We look forward to moving forward. Speaker. Speaker, concern and commitment are two very different things. Un <laughs> University of Toronto housing advocates say that young people like Victoria may have the mistaken impression that it's their fault that their economic stars have not aligned. There might be a sense that they've done something wrong, reads the Generation Squeeze report. Will the Premier commit today, not just express concern, commit to taking the first step in fixing the mess that is causing so many young Ontarians to lose hope for their future? Will she commit to ending this rent control loophole now? Mr. Housing. Mr. Housing. Here we go. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, <clears throat> again, you know, Housing affordability is on the, uh, the lips of, uh, of, of, of virtually all of us. I can't walk down the street without bumping into a neighbour who not only talks about the, uh, the price of housing on our street, but the, uh, the struggle their children face in renting an accommodation or buying their own place. You know, it's, it's what I will commit to today, Speaker, as I said last week to the member opposite. That's why we're, we're already developing a plan to address unfair rises in rental costs by delivering a substantive rent control reform. Uh, on uh, a substantive rental reform in Ontario as part of an ongoing review of the Residential Tenancy Act. Mr. Speaker, we've been working on this since June of last year. We'll have a whole suite Answer. soon. Thank you. No question. The member from Etobicoke Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, soon after I was elected, I learned that the TDSB was planning to sell Silver Creek Public School, which would displace hundreds of children with special needs at Etobicoke Children's Centre and Silver Creek Preschool in my riding in Etobicoke Centre. And it was unacceptable to me that we would endanger services for the most vulnerable children in our community. That is why I made Silver Creek. Saving Silver Creek a priority and worked alongside members of our community, including the Friends of Silver Creek, Etobicoke Children's Centre, Silver Creek Preschool, and multiple ministries, multiple ministers and staff here in our government to save these essential services. Yesterday, Minister, you made an announcement in my riding regarding what our government is going to do about these issues. Speaker, through you to the Minister, Minister, can you tell us more about yesterday's announcement? Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And, and Speaker, phenomenal colleagues like the member from Etobicoke Centre and the member from Kingston and the Islands are exactly what we need in this legislature. I was at the Etobicoke Children's Centre to announce that the province intends to acquire two facilities to preserve the full range of support services that are available to local families. This proposed investment would preserve the support for children's mental health and autism, wow. licensed childcare, autism. Including, including specialized care for children with a range of special needs. And the early years child and family support program currently offered at McNichol Public School in North York and Silver Creek Public School in Etobicoke. Local families can now rest assured the that the programs strategy. and the services that they rely on continue to be there for them and their children. And this development was made possible because of collaboration. Right. Our government has Sir. listened to the communities and the MPPs that represent them. Our government is committed to making it easier to create and maintain yeah, community yeah, parks across Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Minister. It was a true honour to participate in yesterday's announcement. Um, I have to tell you that moments like yesterday are why I ran for MPP, to make a difference for people in our community, and we did that yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday, speaker, yesterday, Speaker, people had tears in their eyes um, during, that, during that moment. Um, through our collective work to protect and preserve these essential services at Silver Creek Public School, I've spoken to countless families, and I have to tell you that I've developed a new appreciation for the importance of these services for children and families in our communities across Ontario. And I'm proud that we recognize the value of both preserving Silver Creek Public School and McNichol Public Schools as vibrant and essential community hubs to support community services in our communities. Uh, with yesterday's announcement that the province intends to acquire Silver Creek, families in Etobicoke Centre, I think, can Question. take comfort in knowing that we are working to maintain services for children with special education needs. Minister, can you tell us more about the important services that these hubs will continue to offer? Mr. Uh, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for the uh, the question. You know, these types of initiatives make me proud to be part of this government here in Ontario. Silver Creek and McNichols School are more than just schools. They are spaces where families come together to access important services. Silver, uh, Silver Creek uh, Public School offers licensed child care and specialized care for children with special needs. Uh, both Silver Creek and McNichol offer a range of child, youth, mental health services and autism programs to children. And they're able to do this, Mr. Speaker, through two amazing programs, organizations, Adventure Place and the Etobicoke Children's Centre. Uh, these types of support are so important to our communities. As my role as the Minister of Children and Youth Services, I've spent a lot of time with parents across the province who know that these types of programs Answer. are so important to help build families yeah. and support children here in Ontario. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. New question, the member from Halliburton, Fourth of Lakes Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Two weeks ago in question period, I called on this government to require mandatory sexual assault training for judicial appointees. At that time, the Attorney General rejected the idea completely, claiming that to do so would undermine judicial independence. So it was curious that yesterday we saw a government member announcing her intention to introduce a private member's bill that does what the Premier and Attorney General, as recently as last week, said they would not support. During her announcement, the member for Davenport claimed that she had the support of her caucus in introducing this bill. All of this makes me wonder if the Attorney General even knows what his caucus colleagues think about this issue. So my question to the Attorney General is, has he come around to support mandatory sexual assault law training for Ontario judicial appointees, or is he just playing political games to avoid taking responsibility? Yeah. Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and, and um, I thank the member for asking the question. I thank, uh, I appreciate uh, the press conference that the member from Devonport did uh, yesterday. Uh, speaker, I think all members of this House, uh, I hope, recognize that when we're dealing with issues around sexual assault, sexual violence, harassment, it's not something that is partisan in nature, Speaker. That is not something that we should be debating in terms of political terms, Speaker. What we should be doing is exactly what our Premier has done, is show leadership in making sure that we've got effective strategies and plans in place to combat sexual violence and harassment. And Speaker, I'm really proud of the Premier to bringing for, by bringing forward its never okay strategy that will ensure yes, that we, in a very meaningful way, put an end to sexual violence and harassment uh, in our province. And there's an opportunity for us to be a leader for the rest of the country. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, back to the Attorney General. You are making it partisan. The mixed signals coming from this government, and there's a clear issue, is doing what is right to protect sexual assault survivors. What you're doing is appalling. I've received many expressions of public support for mandatory sexual assault training for provincial judges, which confirms it is a pressing issue for Ontarians. Hiding behind judicial independence shows a lack of will to act on the part of the government. If the Wynn government was truly serious about this issue, they would introduce this as a government legislation, not a private member's bill. In any case, it always 
always seems like the only way to get this government to act, whether it's on sexual assault training for judges or human sex trafficking, is to shame them into it. So my question to the Attorney Question. General is, when will he stop the political games and tackle the issue of sexual assault training head on like a responsible? Please. 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 Thank you. Order, please. Attorney General. Speaker, I want to tell the member opposite and all members of this House that I, as a member of provincial parliament, I, as the Attorney General of this province, I, as a, as a son and a husband, take the, and as a father of a young daughter, take the issue of sexual assault and harassment very, very seriously. And to make accusations like this, Speaker, is beneath any member of this House. Speaker, what I also take very seriously is the is is the is the very Finish, please. Speaker, what I also take very uh, seriously uh, as Attorney General is the fundamental tenet of our democracy, and that is the independence of judiciary. We all know, Speaker, that in our system of democracy, Answer. we do not get to tell the judiciary as to what they should or not do. That is totally within their scope. I look forward to reviewing the member from Delphi Force bill, you. which I have not, to see exactly what the scope of that bill is. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The CEO, CEO of OPG earned more than $2 million in total compensation last year, not the $1.2 that was stated in the Sunshine List. The government's gradual thawing of public sector executive pay allowed the CEO to walk away with over $2 million in salary, bonuses, pension money, and almost $40,000 in other pay. $40,000 a year is what most young people in this province would be thrilled to earn. They face, and I quote, stagnant wages. How can this premier justify these executive salaries to the struggling young people of this province? Thank you. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, please once again to rise and speak to the great work that uh, OPG is doing in our province, making sure that we have um, affordable power, Mr. Speaker, that's also clean. And I know, uh, Mr. Speaker, that um, on paper those salaries um, do look very large, Mr. Speaker. But let's not forget, Mr. Speaker, that these are the individuals who are nuclear technical experts, Mr. Speaker. The comparators that are used um, make sure that they're not the highest paid in this sector, Mr. Speaker, but they're also not the lowest paid in this sector. We also want to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that our nuclear facilities are run by the best. Please. Mr. Speaker, that our, our nuclear facilities are run by the best people to ensure Answer. its safety and the health for everyone in the province, Mr. Speaker, and that's what the executive is doing at OPG. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier. These high salaries, bonuses, and pension perks are indefensible. They, they're not just high on paper, they're, they're high in the real world, which is the province of Ontario, to the Minister of Energy. Does the Premier understand that a whole generation in this province are struggling with part-time contract and unstable work? They're not getting ahead. They are barely treading water. A new report out today shows that Ontario has the second-worst economy for young people in the country. In fact, and I quote, no province reported a decline in full-time earnings since 2003 except Ontario. This means young Ontarians are working for less money than their parents at a time of skyrocketing rent and hydro costs. When is this government actually going to do something and make more, life more affordable for the people of this province? Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I do acknowledge that these salaries are high, Mr. Speaker, but these are 
our nuclear technical experts that are keeping our facilities <laughs> operating, Mr. Speaker, at high safety standards, making sure that all health and safety standards are being met, and making sure that we have power, Mr. Speaker, right across this province. But when it comes to making sure um, that people have uh, affordable lifestyles, Mr. Speaker, that's what we've done with our fair hydro plan. Bringing forward a plan with a 25 percent reduction, Mr. Wow. Speaker, we worked with the experts at OPG to ensure we can find ways to bring down our rates, Mr. Speaker. A 25 percent reduction for all families, small businesses and farms right across the province, Mr. Speaker, is extremely Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is something that we're very proud to bring forward, Mr. Speaker, which is our Ontario Thank, Fair Hydro Plan that is helping families and businesses right across the province. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Oh. I know that our government is dedicated to working with First Nations as partners in order to achieve better social and economic outcomes. Kaseshwan First Nation community, with an estimated 2,300 residents, has faced a series of floodings for years. Flooding has often caused the community to declare a state of emergency, leaving its residents vulnerable. This is an issue that has been going on for a while and one that requires immediate attention. Can the minister please elaborate on what our government is doing to help the Kaseshwan First Nation community? Thank you. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the uh, safety and well-being of Indigenous communities in Ontario, especially First Nations, is a top priority for this government. We take that matter very seriously. For too long, the people of Kasachewan have had to endure yearly evacuations and to endure all the difficult and social and physical problems that those evacuations entail. With my federal colleague, Minister Bennett, I went to Kasachewan on uh, this past Friday, where we signed a tripartite agreement between Kasachewan First Nation, the federal government, and, on, and Ontario. I met with many members of his community. I was particularly touched by my meetings with the children of the community who are so looking forward to having this difficult issue resolved along with their parents Answer. and grandparents. Canada, Ontario, and Kasachewan First Nation are committed to working together to fix this problem of flooding. Supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. I'm glad to hear that our government is committed to working with First Nations communities such as Kasechewan to address the issues that they face. Everyone should live in a safe, sustainable environment and should not be subject to hardships that are out of their control. That's right. Although there is much work left to do, I am encouraged, encouraged to know that this government is taking the necessary steps to solve this issue. Agreements such as this will help strengthen our partnership with the Indigenous communities. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on what led to the signing of this important agreement? Yeah. Thank you, minister. Speaker, this is what led to the signing of this tripartite agreement. Over the past years, Kasachewan has been subject, subjected to states of emergency and evacuations due to flooding and other issues time and time and time again. It has serious safety, social, and economic impacts on the community. Chief Friday from Kasachewan First Nation wrote to Premier Wynn and asked, and asked that Ontario join with him and the federal government at a table to tackle this issue. We answered Chief Friday's call. We are at the table with the First Nation and the federal government. We understand the immediate concerns and that immediate action has to be taken. Speaker, that's why I went to Kasachewan on Friday and signed that agreement with Minister Bennett and with Chief Friday of the Kasachewan First Answer. Nation. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. On the weekend, I spoke with the executives of Legion Branch 23 in North Bay. Their hydro bill had climbed from $38,000 to over $48,000, and that's despite converting to LEDs, changing the ballast, and doing everything else they were advised to do. Preston Quirt, Bill Jenkins, 
or Bill uh, Wilkins and Jim Thompson, told me that, quote, hydro has broken our back. They told me they were, quote, forced into bankruptcy because of their hydro bills. Wow. Eventually, the Legion was forced to sell their building. They're a prime example of how this government's failed energy policies are hurting communities across Ontario and creating hydro horror stories. Question. I asked the minister, will the government put a stop to their costly vanity ads and address the real hydro crisis they created in Ontario? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question and highlighting um, some of the uh, organizations in this province that are having a difficult time, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we acted with the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, and organizations like Legions and many other institutions that uh, we all have in our writings will see this 25 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we brought forward this plan, Mr. Speaker, is to actually help those organizations, and I'm hoping that the member actually talked about what they would do as a party uh, if, if they ever, Mr. Sure, Speaker, sure had the opportunity to bring forward a plan. But, Mr. Speaker, they have no plan. They have no idea on the system. All they did, Mr. Speaker, was allow the system to deteriorate for decades, Mr. Speaker. Under our government, we rebuilt the system to make sure that we have power in Northern Ontario, that we have now, Mr. Speaker, an affordable plan Thank that you. will help legions right across the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Uh, the, he obviously missed the point that the Legion was forced to sell their building. They're gone. gone. Preston and Billy and Jim told me, quote, this hurts us. We had to lay off staff, and it's hydro that did it. Quote, they can no longer support their pipe ban. They can no longer support their track and field grants that helped so many area men and women make it to the Olympics. They can no longer have a call to a hall to give out to charity events. They can no longer properly take care of their vets. And they told me that's what hurts them the most. And they want to quote lay the blame where it lies, and that it's with their hydro bill. Proud ownership of Branch 23 Legion Building is nothing but a distant memory today, Speaker. Our party has sharing, been sharing these tragic hy hy hydro stories at, at question, question period, mostly to heckling. How many more legions, rinks and restaurants need to close before this Thank minister you. takes any action? Thank you, Mr. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, long before my arrival in this ministry, Mr. Speaker, this government has taken action on building a system to ensure that we have a clean system and a reliable system, Mr. Speaker, something that they didn't do when they were in power, Mr. Speaker. They actually froze rates to make sure that there was no investment in the system. We invested $50 billion, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we have a clean system, a green system, and a reliable system, Mr. Speaker. The Fair Hydro Plan coming forward will now help legions. It will help curling clubs. It will help 500,000 small businesses and families, Mr. Speaker. What we are doing, making sure, is our, our fair hydro plan will actually benefit everyone in this province. They don't have a plan, Mr. Speaker. They don't even have time to consider one, Mr. Speaker. The only thing that that leader can do is pen a letter yes, about sir. saving the NHL and the Olympics, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Order. Order. The member from Leeds Grenville. Leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Ministry of Health has stopped all new admissions to Cedarwood Lodge, a temporary long term care home in Sault Ste. Marie. The Ministry says there is, quote, serious risk of harm to the health or well being of residents. This is deeply troubling news for families whose loved ones live at Cedarwood, and it adds to the stress and worry felt by the 553 people who are waiting today for long term care. 
care in the Sioux. Will the Premier tell the people of Sault Ste. Marie what are the serious risks that have been found at Cedarwood Lodge? And since the Premier has refused to support the NDP's call for minimum standards of care, how is she ensuring residents are going to be kept safe? Mr. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question uh, with regards to Cedarwood. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, it goes without saying that all long-term care residents in this province uh, deserve to live in their homes in these residences safe and secure and in a compassionate environment. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the safety and the quality of care is so important to this government and we've implemented an inspection regime which allows us to provide those assurances and understand in the minority of cases when and if a home isn't provided the standard of care that either they're required to under the Act or that Ontarians should expect to receive in these homes. So it is true that a cease of admissions uh, was issued. The Ministry of Health uh, did this uh, in the case of Cedarwood, and I'm happy to explain and, the sir? reasons behind that in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, families have been concerned about their aging loved ones in Cedarwood Lodge for a long time. In less than two years, this for-profit facility has received at least 20 orders to comply and get this 84 written notices of violation of the law new admissions were suspended back in 2015 speaker and yet it's happening again people in the Sioux and across Ontario want real action to improve the quality of long-term care for all of our seniors but this free premier is refusing to properly staff long-term care homes and refusing to support the NDP's call for a minimum standard of care. Why is this Premier failing to ensure that every senior in Ontario lives with the dignity, the comfort and the safety that they deserve? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, when uh, the ministry conducted a quality inspection uh, late last year, they found uh, a number of areas of non-compliance. They included uh, not following resident plans of care, not identifying triggers to responsive behaviors following a resident altercation that resulted in a physical injury to another resident, not having a program in place for skin and wound care, as well as no falls prevention program not reporting abuse to the director immediately, and not ensuring that there was sufficient collaboration between staff and others uh, in the assessment of resident uh, care and their care plans. Uh, there were instances where uh, changes were made without the approval of the attending physician. So these are serious matters. I want to reassure the residents Answer. of this uh, home care of this uh, long-term care as well as their families that their safety is assured we are addressing these issues Thank and you. monitoring the situation very closely mr speaker Your question the member from Top Corner. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Ma question... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister Delegated to Francophone Affairs. Mr. Speaker, as you know, we celebrated the International Day for Francophonie last month, and I know that our government, and more particularly the Minister for Francophone Affairs, commemorated this in many ways. In fact, it was the first international day for, Frank, Frank, for Francophonie that Ontario celebrates as an observation member for the International Francophonie Organization. I think that's an important moment for Francophones in our province. There are more opportunities than ever before. Can the minister explain how our government works to promote Ontarian Francophonie, Francophonie beyond our borders? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Etibouk North for his question, and I want to say that it is a great friend for Francophonie. Francophonie in Ontario is going very well and also beyond our borders. Last week, I had the opportunity to take part in our first session for our Standing Committee on Francophonie in Paris as an observation member. Another great opportunity to talk about our around 600,000 on Francophone Ontarians, our bilingual institutions, and also Francophone diplomats everywhere in the world. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you that the international community can learn a lot about Francophonie in Ontario, and people are very impressed by our vitality and our institutions. 
So this is a great opportunity to learn more about what Francophonie can offer and our future role in this great international organization. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her answer. And I am very proud that about all the progress that has been accomplished for Francophones. Francophones are part of Ontario's history. I'm part of a Francophile committee, and I have many friends in my writing who take part in this committee. Mr. Speaker, are there other initiatives that could support Francophonie so that the minister can promote Francophonie for generations to come? Thank you. Last Friday, my colleague, Laura Avanizi, and myself, we took part in a federal provincial territorial forum on Francophony immigration. And Mr. Speaker, this was a historical meeting. For the first time in 50 years, the ministers of immigration and Francophony met in order to talk about strategic issues to strengthen immigration for Francophones. And we know that here in Ontario, this immigration will be essential for our Francophone communities. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you that Ontario's voice was heard in Moncton. And I would like to thank my colleague Laura Albanese for her dedication because we are working very hard to reach a target of 5% of immigration uh, for Francophones in Ontario. So we will continue to support our Francophone communities, whether it's through local initiatives or global initiatives so that they can thrive and prosper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. I've been working with a constituent from Dufferin Caledon who is languishing on one of your wait lists. Mr. Alcorn's surgery, surgeon has told him that he requires immediate back surgery, but there is such a long waiting list, it will be one year until his next consultation and at least two years until his surgery. Mr. Alcorn wants to know, why is he being forced to wait three years for his needed back surgery? Thank you, Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, of course, uh, not knowing uh, the specifics of this gentleman's uh, situation, uh, I can't comment uh, specifically. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, we are working hard in making investments, targeted investments, to uh, reduce wait times. I had referenced, I believe, yesterday that uh, Ontario, when it comes to the time from family doctor to specialist and specialist, to the procedure, if one is necessary, that we have the shorted, shortest or among the shortest wait times in the entire country, but there's more work to be done. And one of the challenging areas is with orthopedics and with particularly with back surgery, Mr. Speaker. We have some great examples around the province where we have managed to uh, make improvements both to the wait times but also to uh, enable people Answer. who perhaps don't need that surgical consult and that surgery to have other opportunities to get the support. Uh, but it is a challenging uh, situation. I'd be happy to talk to the member more in detail. Thank about you. Case. Supplementary. I appreciate the offer, Minister. Uh, the targeted wait times are clearly not working for Mr. Alcorn. He needs help now. He is not a, ca a candidate for cortisone injections, and his surgeon has told him there is no other relief that is appropriate or would help. Mr. Alcorn's surgeon has told him that he would be willing to do more back surgeries, but he can't because the operating room has been limited due to Minister's funding model. When will this government stop blaming doctors and address these unacceptable wait times? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I mentioned, I'm happy to talk to the member opposite about this specific case because it's difficult no not knowing the particulars. But we have invested almost $2 billion for more than 3 million additional procedures since we came into office. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, much of that is specific to surgical procedures as well as to those who are experiencing back problems that require a surgical outcome. Uh, but we have, as I mentioned, in Toronto and Hamilton and Thunder Bay, we have a program called Isaac, which uh, addresses specifically people with lower back pain. And through a centralized process and through very supportive, different supportive measures, are able to provide them with the support that they need and, if necessary, the surgery that they require in greatly expedited ways. We're looking at expanding that further, but I, again, I, I make the offer to the, the member you. opposite to discuss it further. New question, the member from Windsor to come Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Morning, Premier. 
I have a sad and an unbelievable story for you. My constituent, Larry Bruner, is on Ontario Works. He gets the max $706 a month. His rent is $406. He has to pay back $35.30 as part of an overpayment. So that leaves him with $264.70 a month to live on. But his hydro bill has gone up to $273.40. So he's $8.70 in the hole before he even thinks about how he's going to get anything to eat or pay any other bills. Speaker, does this government still believe their Question. broad energy policies are going to make life easier for everyone in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for um, bringing forward that question. And I would like to uh, maybe talk with the uh, the MPP afterwards to see if there's anything we can do to try and help this individual, Mr. Speaker, because I don't know all of the circumstances that relate to that. But there are programs that are in place, Mr. Speaker, to actually help uh, individuals like that, Mr. Speaker, because that's why we brought forward the Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, is to help individuals like that. And we are working with um, the Ministry of Community community and social services, Mr. Speaker, to actually ensure that all, all OW um, uh, clients, Mr. Speaker, actually get that Remember reimbursement right Hastings. away. And we're actually working with the CRA to ensure that there is no requirement for a wet signature because we do want to see um, those rebates go to those individuals yes, as quickly as they can, Mr. Speaker, because it is in place, Mr. Speaker, to help individuals just like what the member uh, opposite was talking Thank about. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the rising cost of hydro is fast outpacing any increases people may get on Ontario Works or the ODSP. Even with a 17 per cent cut to hydro bills that's coming sometime next summer, it would leave Larry $37.78 to live on for the month. That's $1.26 a day, a dollar and twenty-six cents a day to live on after your seventeen percent cut that you say is coming sometime next summer. Speaker, what's it going to take to get this government to take better care of people like Larry Bruner, people who need their help the most? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, um, I thank the member for the question and highlighting um, these issues. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we acted with the Fair Hydro Plan. The Fair Hydro Plan is going to be that 25 per cent reduction by this summer, Mr. Speaker. We're going to make sure that individuals who um, are on OW and are most vulnerable actually will see that OESP program, the Ontario Electricity Support Program that I talked about in my previous answer, Mr. Speaker. We've increased that by 50 per cent, Mr. Speaker. And then on top of that, we're actually allowing more individuals to qualify for this program to ensure that they can get these savings back into their pockets, Mr. Speaker. We had to, as I said before, Mr. Speaker, invest in our system, and we recognize that that cost money, Mr. Yes, Speaker. And that's why we're now making sure that the Fair Hydro Plan will bring forward a 25 per cent reduction for everybody across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. A member from Essex on a point of order. Speaker, I want to recognize some friends that are here, Cody Cooper and Dan Gelinas from my neck of the woods, uh, Chatham, Kent, Essex and Essex. Thank you. Um, I normally don't do this, but uh, we did have a former member in the House who regrettably had to leave quickly. Uh, the member from uh, Fort William in the 30th Parliament, Mr. Uh, Ian Angus, was here. He also an, was an MP, uh, so I wanted to recognize him for being in the House. The, the Minister of Finance on a point of order. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to correct my record. I said that we hold majority share at the end of uh, the, the uh, when we when we complete our sale with regards to Hydro One, we will be a major uh, shareholder of their operations. All members have the right to correct their records. There are no deferred votes. This house stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.